All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome to our webinar um, about the use of CRISPR technology to modify genes responsible for hereditary diseases. This webinar is brought to you by Universidad Icesi and by the Valle Lili Foundation in collaboration with Caldo and one of their member universities, Universite Laval. My name is Christian Castano, and I'm an International Relations Coordinator at Universidad Icesi. Before we begin, I'd like to give you some information about Universidad Icesi so you can have a better idea about our institution. Universidad Icesi was founded in 1978 by leaders of industry in the region with the goal of providing high-end education to young talent, thus ensuring a healthy source of human capital here in, in the capital of, of Valle del Cauca. Our drive to constantly improve has resulted in several awards, including achieving the official high quality status from the Ministry of Education, being ranked among the best universities in the world by QS and Times Higher Education, and receiving international accreditations. For the past few years, Universidad Icesi has been in, in a deep alliance with Fundación Valle Lili, which, which was ranked as the fourth best health institution in Latin America. This partnership allows both institutions to constantly improve and help the local community in different ways. The International Relations Office strives to promote internalization, bringing students and faculty from partner institutions closer and bolster intercultural exchanges, which leads us to plan events like today's webinar. I'll now pass you along to Viviana Valencia, Executive Coordinator at Caldo, so she can talk to you about her institution and today's speakers. Thank you very much, Christian. I'm just going to share my, my screen here, just to give you a little bit of information of what Caldo is and, and what we do. Thank you. Yeah, so Caldo, um, Caldo is a consortium of 10 universities, now 10 universities uh, in, from Canada. Uh, these universities uh, differentiate from other Kenyan universities that in the sense that these are research intensive universities. So as you can see now on your screen, uh, these are the universities that form the consortium, uh, the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, Dalhousie University, Université Laval, uh, McMaster University, the University of Ottawa, University of Saskatchewan, the University of Toronto, University of Waterloo, and Western University. So what do we do at Caldo? At Caldo, our primary objective or primary service is that to help prospective uh, graduate students from Latin America to come to, to Canada to do either a master's or a PhD degree. So basically for postgraduate studies. Uh, our services um, are those of us, uh, helping them navigate the, the Canadian education system by providing them with the tools that they need in order to uh, submit a successful application. But our role goes beyond that of just serving students. We also serve uh, our members by helping them connect with the, their Latin America counterparts. This webinar is an example of that, where we try to make those connections between researchers so they know about the research being done in Canada uh, uh, that can be similar uh, in the similar fields that those uh, that, it, that that research that is being done in Latin America. So our basically our our our, our goal or objective is to connect our member universities with Latin America. Just very briefly, uh, if there is any uh, prospective students listening to this webinar on October 1st, we're gonna have a virtual fair where our 10 member universities are going to be present. If any of you is interested in learning more about uh, the, the opportunities that they offer for grad studies, I encourage you to, to attend the, the, the fair. So now to our main, our main events. Uh, I'm happy to present uh, or to be part of this uh, webinar on genetic engineering. And I would like to first um, introduce our, our speakers, our speakers, I'm sorry. Um, so from Université Laval, we have Dr. Jacques Tremblay. And Jacques Tremblay uh, received a PhD in neuroscience from the University of California at San Diego. Since, his completion, since the completion of his PhD in 1974, Dr. Trampley has been at Laval Université as a postdoctoral researcher, a professor, and a director of the Department of Anatomy. He's currently a full-time professor in the Department of Molecular Medicine. He has trained 65 master's degree students, 21 PhD students, and 17 postdoctoral fellows. 
He has published over 290 scientific articles and 551 presentations in Congress, most of them on hereditary diseases. For the last three years, he has also worked on gene correction with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Frederick's ataxia, and familial Alzheimer disease. Thank you very much for being here, Dr. Chambly. And Dr. Alvaro, Alvaro Barrera Ocampo, uh, uh, he's from ICESI. And Dr. Barrera Ocampo is a pharmaceutical chemist with a master's in basic biomedical science with an emphasis in neuroscience from the Universidad of Antioquia. Uh, he graduated in 2004. He also obtained his PhD from the University of Hamburg in Germany in 2013. In Hamburg, he started working as a postdoctoral, I'm sorry, he also conducted a postdoctoral training at Riken Brain Science Institute in Japan, where he analyzed the distribution of synaptic proteins in rat hippocampal neurons subjected to electrical stimulation. In 2014, he worked as, as a postdoctoral fellow at the Universidad of Antioquia, where he focused on the analysis of the lipid profile of a transgenic mouse model of a Alzheimer's disease and the study of lipid species and brain tissue from Alzheimer's disease patients. In 2015, he joined the Center for Science and Pharmaceutical Research as a technical scientific director where he coordinated projects related to drug development and clinical trials. Currently, he's a full time professor of pharmacology at the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences of the School of Natural Science. And, is, and he is also the director of the animal facility at University of Isesi. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Barrera Ocampo. Dr. Barrera sure. Ocampo um, will be actually the person moderating this, this webinar. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Viviana, for your uh, kind words. Um, I'm going to share now my, my screen with you. Let me stop the share here. Okay, now, can you confirm, please, if you see my screen and can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you and we can see your screen. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now, imagine a world where inherited diseases could be treated. Diseases like cystic fibrosis, which affect the lungs and the digestive system, fragile X syndrome, a form of autism, Huntington and Parkinson's disease, which are neurodegenerative diseases that destroy the brain. These diseases are caused mainly by DNA mutations. Now imagine that these diseases could be cured simply by changing the altered nucleotides. All this that I mentioned sounds like a science fiction movie where sophisticated robots, for example, with lasers and scans, cure the diseases in a matter of minutes. Well, this is part of the promise made by the CRISPR-Cas technology. This was first described in 1987. And after 10 years of intense research, it was discovered that together with the nuclease Cas was part of the bacterial immune system. Then it was established that it is also part of the immune system of many other organisms. In 2013, a milestone were reached because uh, for the first time, this technology was used to modify mammalian cells, thus opening a universe of possibilities. In biology, for example, cell lines and model organisms uh, could be easily modified, for example, by knocking out genes uh, to evaluate their function. And uh, now if we see uh, into biotechnology, it has been used to improve plants and optimize the production of secondary metabolites that can be used as a potential drugs. And in biomedicine, for example, it has accelerated the generation of pluripotent stem cells and organoids that can be used to evaluate drug toxicity and other therapies. And the future is wide open. CRISPR has, uh, can, can be also used, for example, in synthetic biology, 
uh, for example, to evaluate viral gene disruption, vector control, drug screening, and especially, and this is the most exciting part, it has great potential for human gene therapy. But how, how does it work, this, this technology? Everything starts with this uh, guide, the guide RNA here in yellow. This finds the spot in the nucleus of a cell where some editing activity should take place. This guide RNA shuffers Cas9 to precise a spot on the DNA where a cut is called for. Cas9 then locks onto, onto this uh, double-stranded DNA and unfolds it. This allows the guide RNA to repair or to pair up with, with a region, specifically with a region of DNA that it has been targeted. Then this Cas9 snips the DNA at this spot here shown by the scissors, thus creating a break in both strands of DNA molecule. Then the cell sensing this problem try to repair this break. Fixing this break might disable the gene, the gene for example, but alternatively this mechanism uh, may repair and fix a mistake or either uh, could be used to insert a new gene. The CRISPR technology has a number of advantages. For example, the simple design, the high engineering feasibility, the multiple genome editing, large scale library preparation, high specificity, high efficiency, and low cost. But it also has some drawbacks. For example, off-target effect uh, incidents, homologous recombination rate frequency, non-homologous end joining mutation rates, immune reaction susceptibility, an RNA guide endonuclease induced of target mutagenesis, and finally, cytotoxicity changes. Ever since uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system was first adapted for use in targeted genome editing uh, around 2012, 2015, the scientific community has made remarkable progress in improving the efficiency and accuracy of editing, expanding the list of application and targetable species. And most importantly, the platform has been used to explore fundamental biomedical questions. So far, it has been used to improve a drug discovery, to treat some kinds, some types of cancers, even to study the function and connectivity of the brain. It has been also used to evaluate HIV treatments, to create biomaterials, and to design diagnostic tools. Some of these tools have been used, for example, uh, uh, for the diagnosis of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, COVID-19 disease. Now, innovative CRISPR-based technology are being developed at a remarkable pace, and uh, the diverse nature of engineering solutions offers a still increasing functionality of the toolbox. Today, Professor Jack Strimbley is going to talk about the use of CRISPR-derived technologies to develop gene editing therapies for hereditary disease. Now, I give the word to Professor Strimbley. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's my time to try to share my screen. I always like it when the technology is working. Here, please reassure me by saying that you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. We, can, we hear can hear you perfectly, and we can see you, but we're still not seeing your presentation, Dr. Trumpley. Uh, now, I, now we cannot hear you. I think. Now um, we can hear you. Yeah. Please you're, still, you're still on mute. Okay. There we go. Well, can you hear me? I can yes. hear. You. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, as mentioned during the introduction, we are using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology 
to develop uh, therapy for at least three hereditary disease, Friedreich ataxia, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and Alzheimer disease. Uh, as mentioned during the introduction, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology uses a single guide RNA that recognizes a sequence of 20 nucleotides, and that sequence of 20 nucleotides has to be followed by a few nucleotides, which is called PAM, the protospacer adjacent motif. And, and for the first Cas9 that was used, that protospacer adjacent motif is NJJ, a sequence which is very frequent in human genome and in all genome. So when a complex is made between the Dr. DNA... Carly, sorry to interrupt you. Oh, we're not seeing your presentation. You're Would you mind sharing your screen so we can see the presentation? Yeah, the screen is being shared right now. Very sorry. Or is just, yeah, I don't want to... Try that not sharing it and then sharing it again. Yes. Air screen. Perfect. We're now seeing it. Okay. That's... We need to. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, and there's that little bar on the top. That is, uh, okay, well, I was, as I was mentioning, there is a complex which is made between three identity, the single guide RNA, the DNA, and the Cas9 nuclease. All three together will induce a double strand break in the DNA uh, at a very precise position, which is exactly three nucleotide from the PAM which is that NGG sequence for the SPCAS9. Now I have the problem that the... Okay. Had problem changing slide. Well, as mentioned, you know, when you induce a double strand break, uh, there is two different uh, repair that will occur. One is non-homology and joining and this is spontaneous repair, and there will be micro-insertion and micro-deletion at the double-strand place. And this will very often change the reading frame of a gene, and this, therefore there will be a, a stop codon that will be encountered later, and this is a way of knocking out a gene. Uh, the other method is to homology-directed repair, and you have to supply a DNA donor with a sequence which is homology, homologous to what is preceding the cut, and a sequence in yellow here which is homologous to what followed the cut. And between these two sequences, you can introduce whatever you want. It can be a complete gene or just a few nucleotides that are introduced exactly at the place where you want it to be. Uh, th this is a great method for introducing or modifying gene, but this works, you know, not so frequently, and therefore it's, it's usually, usually done in vitro, and you have to have some trick to select the cells which are genetically modified, and then expand these cells, and eventually if you want to do a gene therapy, you would have to transplant these cells to the patient. Well, uh, as mentioned, we are using that technology uh, to address Fedrach ataxia, it is an hereditary recessive disease, uh, which is due to a mutation in the Fetaxin gene on chromosome 9. And the mutation is in intron 1. It's very rare to see an hereditary disease due to a mutation in an intron. But in this case, this is an increase in a number of trinucleotide, which is JAA. Uh, normally, normal subjects have between 6 to 34 GAA repeat. But patient affected by Friedreich ataxia has have 150 to 1,700 GAA repetition. And what happened is this makes the expression of the messenger RNA more difficult, and therefore there is a reduction of the production of the Fetaxin protein. And Fetaxin is a mitochondrial protein, and when there is less Fetaxin, 
This leads to oxidative stress. This leads to cell death. And among the cells that are dying, the neurons and the cardiomyocytes, well, they're not replaced. And their death le leads progressively to neurological symptoms, ataxia, and cardiac hypertrophy, leading to a premature death. And now I have the problem that I cannot switch my slide. Let's see, okay, good. Uh, so the, the treatment that we are trying to develop for Friedreich ataxia is to use the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, to use the SP-Cas9 nuclease and two single guide RNA. And what we are targeting is our sequence which precede and follow in intron one the long GAA repeat. The idea is that the problem is due to the presence of that long trinucleotide repeat. And by cutting before and after, we can remove that long trinucleotide repeat. In fact, as illustrated in this slide here, uh, we have, you see, you have the control situation, an untreated cell from a mouse model of Friedreich ataxia. This is a normal cell. And when you treat with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology and you remove the long GAA repeat, you can double the expression of uh, frataxin. And this, we think, would be therapeutic if we can do that uh, in vivo uh, in, in the mouse model and eventually in human. So the, the problem that we had is this was working very well with the first Cas9 nuclease that was discovered, which is SP-Cas9 because it's coming from Streptococcus pyogene. Well, this gene is too big to be delivered with two single guide RNA by a single AAV. A single AAV will contain about 4,700 base pair. That's the most it can contain. And so we started to do experiment with a shorter uh, Cas9 called Canbloblacker uh, Gijuni CG Cas9, uh, which is smaller and therefore could be delivered with uh, two single guide RNA by a single AAV. In fact, uh, using that CG Cas9, we have been able to indeed uh, induce deletion in the uh, fibroblast from a human patient with Friedreich ataxia. Uh, and you can see in this slide that you have the normal uh, amplification product. Uh, and when you cut at before and after the GAA repeat, you have a lower size band uh, due to the deletion of that repeat. So we are currently constructing an AAV to deliver the CG Cas9 and two single guide RNA in vivo to be able to, to do that correction directly in vivo rather than in cells in vitro. Uh, we recently read an article by Ding Henao in CRISPR journal in 2019, indicating that a single nucleotide modification in the single guide RNA scarfold, this is the constant part of the single guide RNA, just the change of one nucleotide uh, was reported to increase the efficacy of uh, this uh, cutting by the, the Cas9 nuclease. And indeed, we have tried that trick and, and we have been successful, as you can see with scaffold number two, which is the mutated scaffold here, we have a better uh, cutting and a, a better, stronger band of uh, deleted uh, of the uh, GAA repeat. Also, one of the problem when you're going to deliver a Cas9 nuclease, either the SP-Cas9 or the CG-Cas9, is this is a foreign protein. This is a protein which is coming from bacteria. And therefore, if there is a sustained expression of that protein, well, you, you will probably have an immune response against that protein. And, and this will destroy all the cells uh, where you have been able to introduce a corrective mutation but then the, the immune system will kill them, and that's so you're not uh, improving very much. So what we decided to do is to develop a technology that we have called Arakiri. Essentially, it is the Cas9 destroying itself. So we are delivering the CG Cas9 with four 
single guide RNA. Two of these single guide RNA are targeting intron one of frataxin before and after the GAA repeat, and two other single guide RNA are targeting the CG Cas9 itself. So as you can see, the CG Cas9 will eventually, when it is expressed, will be able to destroy itself. In fact, uh, we have done that, and as you can see, uh, we can remove part of the uh, we're cutting here with one single guide RNA, we're cutting there with the other single guide RNA. We are removing a large part of the CG Cas9 gene, and so therefore we are reducing the expression of that protein as seen in the Western blood. Uh, we can detect this truncated CG Cas9. This is a normal size. This is after we have removed a large part of the gene. But despite the fact that CG Cas9 is destroying itself, we are still able to delete the GAA repeat. In fact, the GAA repeat will be done as soon as the CG Cas9 protein is expressed. That protein will remain expressed for a few hours or a few days. It will be able to do its job of removing the GAA repeat, although uh, the, there will be a, not a sustained expression of CG Cas9. So I, I think this trick of Harakiri can eventually be used for several applications of the CRISPR Cas9 technology to modify gene without inducing an immune response. So as mentioned in the introduction, we are also using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to uh, try to, uh, to cure Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There are three different graduate students that have worked on this project. And uh, the dystrophin gene is a very big gene. It contains 79 exons. And th th there's a scheme here of these 79 exons. So if you look, for example, at exon three, uh, it starts with a vertical bar. It means that the three nucleotides, which are part of the first codon in that exon, they are complete. And it, the exon three ends with a vertical bar, meaning that the three nucleotides, which are part of the last codon in that exon, are there, they're complete. But you can have a different situation. For example, if you look at exon six, you have like an arrow there because there is one nucleotide, nucleotide of the last exon. Uh, there's only one nucleotide. The other two nucleotides that will complete that codon are present in an exon seven. And you have the reverse situation with the end of exon seven, uh, where you have just two nucleotides which are present uh, in that last codon, and the complementary, the, the third nucleotide is in exon eight. So you can see that if you do a deletion of uh, an exon, for example, let's start with uh, exon uh, uh, 51. Uh, you see, if you delete exon 51, in the messenger RNA, exon 50 will be connected directly with exon 52. But since exon 50 is expecting two nucleotides at the beginning of exon, the following exon to form a codon, everything is changed. You don't need the, the right two nucleotides and after this initial new nucleotide, all the other codon are, are changed. And, and so eventually you will meet in exon 52, you'll meet a stop codon. And this is called, therefore this is a frequent type of mutation in DMD patient. There is a deletion of one or several exons and this change the reading frame leading to a stop codon, and therefore the beginning of the protein is expressed, but the end of the dystrophin protein is not expressed, and this protein is not located underneath the muscle fiber membrane. So we have again an example here where the patient had a deletion of exon 50 in that example. Again, exon 49 being connected directly with exon 51. There's a reading frame shift and you produce only the beginning of the protein, but not the end of the protein. But there is one therapy which is being investigated by, and in fact, it's being commercialized uh, by, by Sarepta now, uh, which is to do exon skipping. The idea is to use antisense oligonucleotide, which are masking the splice acceptor in one of the exons. For example, in this case, you're masking the splice acceptor of exon 51. 
And so therefore, in the final messenger RNA, you have the exon 49, which is connected directly with exon 52. You can see now that the total number of nucleotides that have been deleted that were in exon 50 and in exon 51, the total number of deleted nucleotides is now a multiple of three nucleotides, and therefore the reading frame is respected, and we have a complete, well, we have the beginning of the dystrophin protein, which is expressed, the end of the dystrophin protein is expressed, and there is a small part of the dystrophin protein which is missing. Well, th this kind of uh, treatment for, for uh, restoring the normal reading frame uh, has been done with antisense oligonucleotide, but it can also be done using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And there were three back-to-back -back articles that were published in Science in uh, uh, December two, 2015. Well, my own paper was submitted before those three papers, but it was published only in January 216, and therefore most author kind of forget to mention my paper published in January, January 2016. So that, what, what's happening by deleting exons like that, what you are doing is changing the uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient into a Becker muscular dystrophy patient. Becker muscular dystrophy patient, they have also mutation in the dystrophin gene, but uh, their mutation is such that uh, they have deleted very often several exons also, but there is no frame shift, and therefore they can express the beginning of the protein and the end of the protein, and, and so many Becker patients will be able to walk. In fact, some uh, the, the, uh, one Becker patient was identified as having a large deletion in the dystrophin gene, and yet he was able to walk until the age 65. So in fact, by restoring the normal reading frame, what you're doing is, is uh, modifying a Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient into a Becker patient. So although some Becker patients are able to walk till the age of 65, other Becker patients have a very severe symptom. Some of them are bound to a wheelchair at the age of 11. So it all depends what part of the dystrophin protein is missing, and sometimes <laughs> it's... Uh, influence the severity uh, of the symptom. So if you're converting a Duchenne muscular dystrophy into a patient into a Becker, a severe Becker patient, you don't have much improvement of the phenotype. So as I mentioned, dystrophin protein is a complex protein. In fact, the, this protein is illustrated here in blue. It's located underneath the sarcolemma, the muscle fiber. And as you can see, it's interacting with several other proteins. Uh, but the central part of that protein, there are, are numbers 1 to, to, uh, to 24. And so these are spectrin-like repeat. There is 24 spectrin-like repeat. Each one of these spectrin-like repeat is made of three alpha helix, helix A, helix B, and helix C. And as you can see, helix A is starting on the left side, and helix C is ending on the uh, right side. So normally you have a succession of ABC, 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 and this is the normal structure of the central part of the dystrophin protein. The, the problem with these spectrin like repeat is the beginning and the end of the spectrin like repeat, which are indicated here by the black arrow. You can see, for example, the spectrin like repeat number seven here. It's starting within exon 23 and it's finishing within exon 26. So when you're doing deletion of an exon, for example, you're deleting exon 51, you are deleting part of a spectrin like repeat, you're deleting the end of a spectrin like repeat, and you're deleting the beginning of another spectrin like repeat. So you're deleting here part of, of helix C, and you are deleting part of helix A, and, and this will form a, a strange structure. In fact, uh, it has been identified by the Nicola et al. in Human Molecular Genetics in 2015 that for some deletion, for example, here you have a deletion of exon 45 to 49. This is a Becker patient because the reading frame is respected. You have a direct connection of exon 44 
with exon 50, there's no reading frame shift. The beginning of the protein is expressed, the end of the protein is expressed, but at the site of the junction, we have the end of helix B coded by exon 44, which is fused with the end of helix C coded by exon 50. And this creates a strange structure in the dystrophin protein, and that dystrophin protein doesn't work properly. And, and so this Becker patient is a severe Becker patient, despite the fact that the beginning and the end of the protein is expressed. So to address this problem, instead of deleting complete exons, as has been done by Olson group, uh, when he was deleting exon 23 and the dystrophin in the MDX mouse, uh, we have used the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to cut at two sides. So you can see here we started with the myoblast of a real Duchenne patient. That patient had the deletion of exon 51, 52, and 53. We had exon 50 connected directly with exon 54. And as you can see, therefore, there's a stop code on somewhere in exon 54 due to the frame shift. So our idea was to cut with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology in exon 50 and cut in exon 54 to create an hybrid exon 5054. But this hybrid exon, we selected a place to cut in exon 50 and in exon 54 such that we did not only restore the normal reading frame, but we created this uh, hybrid exon would contribute to produce a dystrophin protein that has a normal structure. So uh, my graduate student started that project by initially starting to detect all the PAM, which is our NGG sequence for the SPCAS9. So he detected 10 different PAM in exon 50, as indicated here. And so, so, when, so some when the sense strand on other PAMs were in the anti-sense strand. He also detected 14 different PAMs in exon 54. So this gave us a, a lot of uh, sites where we could cut with the guide RNA in exon 50 and in exon 54. So we finally realized that our best pair of guided RNA was guided RNA1 cutting in exon 50, it cuts in helix C, and guided RNA5, which cuts in exon 54, also cut in helix C, and this results in the production of an hybrid helix C, where the beginning is coded of the helix C is coded by exon uh, 50, and the end is coded by the exon 54. So this drawing here is not simply something that, that we imagine. We give to some uh, computer researcher uh, in the Faculty of Science of my university, which are doing structure of protein. We give them the sequence of the resulting amino acid, and this is a structure that the computer predicted a correct uh, helix C. Well, I then had a, another student that worked on that project, and instead of using the SPCAS9, which was the first uh, nuclease that was uh, discovered, he used the CGCAS9, no, he used, sorry, the SACAS9, which is another uh, nuclease, uh, and he identified two pairs of guide RNA. This is one pair, this is another pair of guided RNA, and in both cases, uh, he was cutting in LXB, he was producing an hybrid helix B where the beginning was coded by exon 44. This is a cut in exon, no, sorry, in exon 47. And the end of that hybrid helix B was coded by exon 58. So therefore, he had two pairs of guide RNA able not only to restore the normal reading frame, but able in this case to create in helix B, which had a normal structure. The, the great advantage of that pair of guided RNA is that it is a solution for any deletion that would occur between exon 47 and exon 58. Could be a deletion of several exons in between these 47 and 58. It can be just a point mutation happening in exon 55, for example. All of these mutations, can be cured 
by using the SA uh, class 9 and, and a single pair of guide RNA that would be delivered by a AAV. Um, okay, I think I'll skip this one. In fact, we, we have done this experiment in a nice mouse model called the HDMD Delta 52 mouse. This mouse has the complete human gene, dystrophin human gene with all intron, all exon, except that it has a deletion of exon 52, which changed the reading frame, and therefore this mouse does not express human dystrophin. This mouse also is on an MDX background, so therefore the dystrophin gene of the mouse doesn't work also. So we have delivered to this mouse AAVs coding for the SA Cas9 and two single guide RNA. And this was a systemic delivery, an intravenous delivery. And as you can see, one month later, we have collected the several muscle, the diaphragm, the tibialis anterior, the ADL, the gastrodemius, the soleus. So in all of these muscle, we were able to detect the expression of dystrophin, as can be seen uh, in a Western blood and as can be seen uh, by immunohistochemistry. So therefore, this is a very good potential treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I must say the only reason why I'm not doing that in patient is I don't have the grants, the large grants, which would be required. It would be probably a gain between 10 million and $15 million to be able to do that uh, gene correction on 10 patients in a clinical trial because the production of the AAV in good manufacturing practice condition costs a fortune. It costs about $1 million per patient to produce the virus in GMP condition. So th th this is potentially a very great treatment because this would be a permanent treatment of the Shane muscular dystrophy. Well, what is very exciting with the CRISPR-Cas9 technology is that it is evolving very rapidly, and now it's possible to use that technology to mutate single nucleotide instead of. So, in fact, uh, there are 32,000 different pathological human SNPs, modification of single nucleotide, which are responsible for about 7,000 different hereditary disease. And a lot of these mutation can be corrected. For example, the one in blue, this could be corrected by changing a CG pair into a TA pair. And this was published by Godelli in Nature 2017. So in fact, that base editing technology use a SPCAS9 nickase, which is fused with the cytidine deaminase. And therefore, again, you are using a single guide RNA to position your, your Cas9 nickase, but this Cas9 nickase is fused with that cytidine deaminase, and it will be able to change, chemically change, a cytidine into a uridine, and during DNA repair, this uridine will be converted into a timing. So uh, this is a very interesting technology. And as soon as the paper was published, of course, we tried it. And uh, so these are the different enzymes that uh, were mentioned by Comor, who developed that technology in 2017. Uh, you have the Cas9 nickase, which is uh, fused with a cytidine deaminase with the cysteine amino acid linker. And here there is a, an enzyme called uracil glucotyroid inhibitor, which prevents the reversion of the mutation. It prevents going back from the uracil back to the cytosine. Uh, in fact, uh, one, one of the problem of that technology is that the cytidine deaminase will change the C into a T, into a window, which is about, which is about five nucleotide long, which is about 12 to 16 base distant from the PAM, which is that NGG sequence you see here. So uh, we initially tried to use that technology for the uh, 
uh, making a correction for Alzheimer's disease. So one of the problems that we had is that there were several cytidine in the range where we wanted to mutate only one of these cytidine into a thymine. So let me introduce a bit to, uh, uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is due to the abnormal metabolism of a transmembrane protein called amyloid precursor protein, in short, APP. So this is this transmembrane protein. Normally, it is degraded by cutting with the alpha secretase, followed by a cut by the gamma secretase, and this produces fragments which are degraded and cause no problem. But the APP protein may also be cut by the beta secretase, followed by a cut by the gamma secretase, and this produces short amyloid beta peptides, which are 40 to 42 amino acid long. And the problem with these peptides is they, they aggregate to one another. They form the amyloid plaque that interfere with synaptic transmission, eventually leading to neuron death and to the memory problem, which are characteristic of Alzheimer. So th this is a sequence of uh, the part of the transmembrane protein of the amyloid precursor protein. You can see how the amino acids name of these uh, uh, of these amino acid, and, and you can see that the, the beta secretase is cutting here, the alpha secretase is cutting there, the gamma secretase is cutting there, and all the amino acid with a star above the the, the name. Uh, well, these are amino acids that when they are changed, they will lead to a familial form of Alzheimer's disease. This is a, due to a mutation. These mutation leads to uh, to early onset Alzheimer's disease, these patients will start to have memory problems as young as 40 or 45. Well, you can notice that I've put here a red arrow in that position. It's an alanine in position 673 of the protein. You change this alanine for valine, you start to be Alzheimer at the age of 40. But you change this alanine for threonine, it prevents you from being Alzheimer. This has been reported in the Icelandic population by Johnson et al. in Nature 2012. It's just turned out that this mutation, as you know, is located very close to the beta site cut site, beta secretase cut site. And, and it prevents, it reduces the cutting by the beta secretase. Therefore, it reduces the formation of these amyloid peptides, and therefore it delays the formation of amyloid plaques, and you can live up to 95 or 100 years old without being Alzheimer. So it's not an obligation to become Alzheimer as you get older. There is a solution. And this mutation is present in, in the Icelandic population, but unfortunately, it's not frequent, and it's only present in 0.1% of the Icelandic population. It has not been identified in any other country. And, and so it's a very rare mutation because there is no reproductive advantage to that mutation. It's just an advantage as you get older and you don't become Alzheimer. So our idea was to eventually change the codon for alanine, changing it into a codon for trionine. It just happened that the antisense codon here, we have the alanine codon. And here we have the antisense codon. And in the antisense codon, we can change that C into a T. And this would become the antisense for threonine. And therefore, you have changed an alanine into a threonine. And therefore, you have introduced that A673T mutation, which I think is able to protect against Alzheimer's disease. In fact, I'm so confident in that that I have applied for patent on this eventual treatment. Uh, <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, uh, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 base editing technology can be used to change a cytidine into a thymine, and this is the, uh, is the technology that we initially used to introduce that A673T mutation. Uh, the problem, as I mentioned, is that uh, there are several C in the antisense sequence which are near the one we wanted to change the C2. We wanted to change this one, but there are C1 here, C C3, C4, and C5, which are close to the C that we want to modify, and therefore 
the citidine deaminase may also change the citidine into thymine. So to prevent this change, we have made several different modifications of the fusion protein, which is the SPCAS9, or, or a fuse uh, with, uh, with various citidine deaminase in different position. And as you can see, we have made all those construction and tested them until we identified uh, one of those combinations that was working very well and able to change C2 without changing too much uh, the other uh, C, C nucleotide. So th this we, we found an hybrid enzyme that was more specific. And uh, so initially we wanted to try to see if that Icelandic mutation, which is A673T, can that protect against the mutation that are leading to early onset Alzheimer's disease. So, so one of those mutations is the London mutation, and uh, it's a very frequent, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sorry about that. So th this London mutation is one of the most frequent uh, mutation in the amyloid precursor gene which lead to early onset Alzheimer's disease. And, and we found that the presence of the additional presence of the Icelandic mutation in a gene already containing the London mutation can indeed lead to a reduction of the uh, production of the Abeta 40 uh, amyloid peptide and also to a reduction of the A-beta 42 peptide. As you can see, uh, without the amyloid, Without the A673 mutation, you have a large production of A beta 42, a large production of A beta caram. Uh, but if you introduce the A673 mutation, you reduce this uh, production of, uh, of the amyloid peptides. And therefore, we believe that this correction would eventually prevent the development of Alzheimer's disease in them. And, and we've done that for a lot of different uh, mutation in the amyloid precursor gene. In about 50% of them, the introduction of the A673 mutation will be protected. But I believe that the introduction of the A673 mutation will also be protective for most of the sporadic form of Alzheimer's disease because it will reduce the production of the amyloid peptides. And now since uh, October 2019, I am very excited about a new technology called prime editing. Uh, this technology again use the SPCAS9 Nikase, but this time the SPCAS9 Nikase that we see here is linked, it's fused with a reverse transcriptase. And this uh, uh, fuse enzyme is using a PEG RNA primer prime editing single guide RNA. So it's, it's the same. You have, again, this sequence of 20 nucleotide that will detect a sequence in the DNA. Uh, the different loops here are the constant part of the single guide RNA. And then they have added this three prime extension here in the PEG RNA. And so the, this, uh, <clears throat> this three prime extension will permit to uh, one part of that three prime ex extension is a primer binding site. It, it used as a primer for the reverse transcriptase. And then we have another sequence of a 10 to 16 nucleotide, which is called the reverse template 10 template. And as you can see, the, the nucleotide in red here, they have been changed. So if you want to have in, in the upper strand, if you want to have a, a adenosine, in this position, you will introduce a thymine. So when the reverse transcriptase will copy this template, it will introduce an adenosine in here. So according to the author, this technology can be used to modify one or several nucleotide. It can be used to introduce or delete one or several nucleotide also. 
And, and so th th this was a very exciting paper, and you can be sure that the next day I went back to the lab and, and told my research assistant and my graduate student that we have to try that. So w what's nice about this uh, uh, technology, this prime editing technology, is that the, the, there were several plasmid already available by the, made available by the authors on ad gene. And so this is one of the plasmid to construct the PEG RNA. You can remove by cutting with two restriction enzyme, you can remove that red fluorescent protein gene. And, and now you have two sites here, which will be used to make the, the construction. You can order the PEG RNA sequence. This is the 20 nucleotide sequence that will recognize a sequence in the DNA. And then you can also synthesize. You, these are just nucleotides that you order from IDT that will code for the PEG three prime extension. This will code for the, the, the primer and the reverse transcriptase template. And, and then there is this constant part of the single guide RNA. So in fact, you have four pieces. You have the backbone of the plasmid. You have the, the, the sequence that correspond to the guide itself and the, extends, the extended three prime PEG RNA. And, and the constant part, you put all these four parts together and, and they will fuse together and they will form the pig RNA. Fantastic. You know what? It works. So uh, we are currently using the prime editing technology to introduce the A673T mutation in the amyloid precursor gene. We are using that technology to correct point mutation responsible for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I mentioned that 70% of the mutation in Duchenne muscular dystrophy are due to deletion of one of several exons. The other 30% are very often a single nucleotide change that introduce a stop codon in the dystrophin gene. And because of a change of a single nucleotide, you have a Duchenne patient. So with that technology, we are aiming to correct point mutation that have been identified in 29 Canadian patients. We have also started a new project, which is to correct the cystic fibrosis uh, mutation. Uh, it's a mutation in the CFTR gene, which is responsible for cystic fibrosis. And we're trying to correct that. And I'm also working on a correcting a point mutation responsible for uh, ataxia 8. So, so the very nice thing about the prime editing technology is that in principle, it could be a treatment for thousands of different kidney steady disease. Well, as you know, we are now have the severe problem of having the COVID-19 uh, SARS-2V virus. And, and so my lab was closed for, for a few months and we could work in the lab only if we were working on developing a treatment or doing something for COVID-19. So with the help of a graduate student, we have been working on developing a test for a rapid and simple test for COVID-19. The test is based on a temper, uh, uh, an amplification of part of the uh, virus genome. Uh, this is an amplification which is done at constant temperature. And then we use the Cas13A, which is another protein from the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And that Cas13A will recognize a RNA sequence specifically. It will cut specifically that RNA sequence. But once it has cut a specific sequence, it will then become activated and it will cut all other RNA in the neighborhood. Well, when I initially read about that, I thought this is completely useless for developing a therapy, but it turns out it's very, very useful for developing a test because the, the, the people that have developed the Sherlock technology, which is similar to what we are doing, uh, they are putting in the neighborhood, you see here, this is the, the RNA that you want to cut with the uh, Cas13A. So it will cut that specific RNA, which is the blue target, but then it will cut these yellow RNA. And the, it just turned out that these yellow RNA, well, they have uh, some uh, markers on them. 
uh, in our case, we are using a fluorescent marker at one hand, and at the other hand, we have a quencher. And so these little fragments of RNA are normally not fluorescent. But when they are cut by the non-specific activity of Cas13A, this will separate them in two fragments, and therefore the green fluorescence due to fluorescein will become visible. In fact, this is a scheme here of that uh, lamp amplification, which is blue mediated isothermal amplification. In fact, we switch to that type of amplification because one of the problem is that many of the reagents used for RPA amplification or PCR amplification, they have become limited. They are very hard to buy from the company that makes them. And so we switch to that loop mediated isothermal amplification because there are several companies that are providing the necessary reagent. So following amplification, as I mentioned, by that loop amplification, we are then cutting reporter, little piece of RNA, which contain a fluorescein and a quencher. And when you do that, you obtain the following results. As you can see, these are all negative samples, and we have here positive sample. You have see, you can see the green fluorescent, which is visible with the naked eye using simply a black light. And, and so the test would be very simple. It, it can be done without having a PCR instrument, without doing temperature cycling. And the test is almost ready. We have a few little supplementary tests that we want to do, but uh, we are hoping to send this uh, test to some collaborator in Brazil. And we have also three African country where we have collaborators and we'll send them the test so that uh, these uh, country can use this easy test to start uh, testing for COVID-19. And this is the end of my talk, and I hope that some of you are still there. <laughs> Thank Hello. you very much, Dr. Tremblay. Thank you so much for that informative uh, presentation. We understand that, that CRISPR is, is a technology that's relatively new. It has a lot of promises, not only in hereditary diseases like Alzheimer's, but also in COVID-19 and different, uh, different diseases that we have now and may have in the future. So thank you very much. This is a, a topic that's very interesting for many reasons at this moment. Okay, any other question from the audience? Yes, please. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat and Dr. Barrera will gladly translate them so Dr. Tremblay can, can answer them. Well, I would like to start with, with one, one question. Uh, just to give a time to the to the audience to, to formulate their, their own questions. Uh, when you were talking about the CJ Cas9 uh, technology, uh, I was wondering what is the efficiency of traduction reached with this uh, uh, ABV uh, carrying uh, what the, the construct. Uh, when you when you use it, for example in cells, in cell culture, uh, and have you tried in, in, in animals in vivo? Uh, do you know uh, how is the, this, this uh, efficiency? Yeah, we, ha we have not done yet the in vivo experiment. As you know, the in vitro experiment are easier to do. And uh, one of our problem is that uh, <clears throat> we are not making the AAV vectors ourselves. There is a facility at Laval University that produce a vector for me. Uh, it, it costs about a thousand dollar to have enough AAV to inject three mice, so mm -hmm. it's, ex it's expensive. It's expensive yeah. But the major problem is sometimes we are waiting for a few months to have the production of the AAV of interest. So th this is very expensive for mouse research. But as I mentioned, it's even more expensive when you're trying to use these AAV in, in a clinical setting. In fact, you may be aware that there are now five different gene therapy treatment that have been approved by, for commercialization by FDA. But all of those treatments are above a million dollars. Some of them are two million and three million dollars. This is a fantastic price. And I think it's not worth developing a therapy, for example, for Alzheimer's disease, if the treatment is more than a million dollars per person. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Let's try to find something else. <laughs> yes, that doesn't make any sense. And have you thought about the, the strategy that could be used to, to deliver this, this ABV uh, with the system, with the, with the uh, uh, whatever you want, the, the CRISPR system, the base 18 system, uh, for example, in patients? Yeah, uh, have you exactly. thought about liposomes or some of this kind Yeah, of we are working on an alternative delivery technology. We are working with uh, uh, extracellular vesicles, also called exosomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are doing good progress. We have been able to introduce the Cas9 protein and single guide RNAs into the extracellular vesicle. Uh, and we have been able to deliver them in vivo and recently we have shown that we can introduce mutation in the brain following simple inhalation of the uh, extracellular vesicle containing the Cas9 protein and some guide RNAs. So I think it's very promising. Wow, yes. yes. And I hope that the, uh, the extracellular vesicle can be purified from human plasma. You may know that uh, the human plasma contains 10 to the power of 15 Mm -hmm. extracellular vesicles per liter of plasma. So I think that they can be purified from the patient own plasma. We can introduce the reagents that we want in them and give them back to the same patient a few mm -hmm. hours later. And, and hopefully this would be a solution that would be much cheaper than using adeno-associated virus. Well, that, that will be a game changer because this is the big limitation, you know, the uh, treatments for the CNS, you know, the, they don't cross the brain blood barrier and where everybody is, 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 is thinking. Yeah, well, there, there, are, there are some AAVs that do cross the blood brain barrier. There's one that has been published by Caltech called AAVPHP.B. Uh, we've tried that AAV, it does indeed cross the blood brain barrier. At least in mice, there are some questions whether it's crossing the blood-brain barrier in monkeys. I don't know if it will work in humans. But, but uh, the main problem, I think, of the AAV is not whether or not they can reach different organs. It's the price of producing them in GMP condition. Okay, now, now we have a couple of questions here. The first one is, uh, are there any bioethical restrictions that may slow down investigation process? Well, e each time you, you want to, to do something in clinic, you have to obtain the permission, at least in Canada, we have to obtain the permission of Health Canada and the permission of the Human Ethics Committee of the hospital. And, and believe me, I've done that for a clinical trial of myoblast transplantation for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is very, very, tedious work, but you know, very often the companies are paying experts to, to prepare these documents for the regulatory agency. In Canada, it's Health Canada. In the United States, it's the Food and Drug Administration, best known as FDA. And so it's so complicated to fill these documents for uh, these regulatory agencies that most of the company will hire experts which are in fact people that previously worked for FDA to fill the paperwork for presenting to FDA. And, and again, this is the kind of money that I don't have. I don't have the money for the production of the uh, AAV in larger num number in GMP condition, and also don't have the money to pay for expert to fill the paperwork for FDA or, or Health Canada. Well. Uh, we have a, another question. Uh, it says, how does, uh, how does it work, the Harakiri the disactivation uh, in the Cas9? You could explain that again. How, how the deactivation of Cas9 works? Yes. Yeah, well, well, in fact, you see the Cas9 gene that you have introduced, let's say, with an AAV vector or with an uh, extracellular vesicle, you introduce that gene into the cell. And, uh, then, and you also introduce at the same time various guide RNA. The two of those guide RNA or one of those guide RNA may be to target your gene of interest to produce the mutation that you want to produce. And two additional guide RNA are targeting sequence which are within the 
SP Cas9 gene that you have introduced. It could be also in the SA Cas9 gene or into the CG Cas9 gene. You're targeting two sequences within that gene such that you are cutting at two sides. You are removing a large part of the gene and the gene will no longer produce a protein which is functional. But the gene has already produced some protein initially and these proteins that were produced <coughs> are able to mutate your target gene, but they are also able to mutate your Cas9 gene. And so your Cas9 gene will no longer be able to produce new protein. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. I, I hope it's not COVID-19, but I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'm a few feet away from my screen. I'm hope I'm not contagious. <laughs> Social distancing. Well, uh, we have a, yes, uh, we have another, another question. This is uh, also uh, related with uh, bioethics. Uh, uh, what is your opinion uh, uh, about uh, the uh, genetic uh, edition in humans uh, aiming? To improve the, the human uh, species, for example, taking babies, uh, we're designing designing babies. Uh, you can find even some web pages uh, offering this this kind of of, of services. Well, uh, I, I think that we still have a long way to go to to make safe modification of the human genome to cure hereditary disease. And as far as I know, there are 7,000 different hereditary disease. So I think we have worked for a few years. Yes. And when we can do that safely, then the question will become, you know, what is an hereditary disease? If you have a high Q of only 70, and this is due to some gene polymorphism, can that be considered as an hereditary disease? Should that be a modification that we will make so that the person, instead of having a high Q of 70, now has a high Q of 120. Well, th this is our question for the future. I, I think at this point it's still too early and we have to proceed with caution. And, and I, I think that just trying to just cure the hereditary disease is, is enough work for a few years. And this will hopefully help us to identify what are the problems with that technology and how to make it safe because before we try to do something more fancy. Okay. So wait, I think we have uh, one last question. Uh, it's re uh, related with the gene reporting. Uh, how did the design of the sequence of this gene reporter that, uh, uh, to work with the Cas13? Uh, in fact, uh, the Cas13A will cause will cut almost any RNA sequence, but there are some preference. And so we have designed a short RNA that contains sequence which are among the best to be cut by the Cas13A. And so the, this short sequence has been synthesized by IDT with one fluoroserine at one hand and a quencher at the other hand. And so we design the sequence, but we don't make it, we buy it. Okay, uh, I have a, a last question regarding this, this uh, test that you are developing. Uh, how, how is the sensitivity and the specificity of this, of this test? Well, uh, th that's, that's a question that remains to be answered. We want to do a calibration curve to see how, to how many copies we can go down. Can we get down to one copy of the virus per 10 microliter? Mm -hmm. that, that's a question that remains. Uh, what was the second? Uh, <clears throat> and the specificity of the, of the test. Uh, yeah, well, so far it, it seems to be very specific. For example, if we introduce uh, other part of the, uh, we, we're detecting right now the S gene or the N gene, and we have a uh, sequence which are specific for each of these parts. So, so if we don't use the right guide RNA for the, the sequence that we have amplified, it doesn't work. So it seems, but, but another test that we have to do, so far we're supplying to the test part of the sequence of the virus, not complete virus, because we don't have the, 
laboratory for that kind of restriction. Mm -hmm. So eventually we want to do the test with real, uh, real virus. And the second thing that we want to do is do the test in presence of human uh, extracts. That is RNA that are extracted or DNA which are extracted from human samples to make sure that the, human pre the presence of human sequence do not interfere with the test. But, but in principle, it, it should work. The amplification is using primers, which are specific for some sequence, and uh, uh, I, I think it should work. But we have to do these tests before we can send uh, the test for field trial uh, mm -hmm. in Brazil and in Africa. Uh, what we will ask to our collaborator is to compare the results of our new test with regular PCR tests. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they will do a, with one sample of the patient, a PCR reaction, which is already approved by FDA. And, and then they will use part of the sam patient sample to test with our test to see if we detect all the positive tests and if we don't detect false negative uh, results. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is, that's very important. So th there's still a, a few weeks of work. Uh, it, it has been... Uh, for several months of work to develop that. Uh, hopefully, well, not hopefully, but I think that unfortunately, the COVID-19 virus is uh, around for still several months. Yes, I think so. We have a, a, another question. Uh, what do you think uh, about using CRISPR-Cas for cloning and, and bringing an extinct animal to life again? Is that possible? Well, as I, 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 <laughs> the Cas9 technology in itself is not a cloning technology. Mm -hmm. what, what it could permit is to modify, and I think the technology is already used to modify the genome of plants and to modify the genome of animals. There's no question that that technology will be used for that. And there are already plants that have been genetically modified for crop production. And I think the same thing will happen with animals. They will modify some gene to make it more favorable for uh, ha having muscles that grow bigger, faster, for production of meat. So all of those things will happen soon, if not already done. Yes. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues, Dr. Moineau, uh, who is uh, one of the ones that uh, started to work on CRISPR when it was only research on bacteria. Well, he has produced bacteria that have, uh, uh, that are mutated. They are more resistant to several bacteriophage. And these modified bacteria are already used for production of cheese and, uh, and uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name in English, but they, they are used for production of, of cheese. Okay. So animals will be modified. Okay. Be sure of that. Plants will yes. be modified. Yes. The only question is when will we modify human? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a big question. Um, we have a question regarding the, well, the, the risk of using this technology, but uh, I will uh, ref, uh, formulate this question uh, more in terms of the and what are the off-target uh, effects of, for example, this base editing uh, of those uh, of CRISPR-Cas, for example? Is it more safer used to use the base editing and the prime technology that's than CRISPR? Do you expect uh, less off-target uh, effects? Well, I, I think that the prime editing technology will be more precise than the basic CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Because, uh, you know, it's complex. You have to have a, a single guide RNA that recognizes a sequence of 20. And then you have to use this. And first of all, it, it's using a Cas9 nickase. It's not using Cas9 nuclease. And so it's making an, a cut in only one of the two DNA strand, uh, which will reduce the off-target. And as I mentioned, the three prime extension it contains a primer and contain a reverse transcriptase template. All of that is very restrictive to make a mutation somewhere else where it will work. The, the main problem will be to identify 
what are the potential off targets and verify whether or not there are mutation at these potential off targets. And uh, so even when you do that, you know, you wouldn't have to do whole genome sequencing, but even the sequencing technology themselves, you know, sometimes will produce some error. So is that an error or is that a mutation that has been introduced by the Cas9 technology? It will be difficult at one point. And I think the best thing will be to uh, test those things in animal model. If, if we can cure, for example, Fred Reich ataxia in a mouse model, and there seems to be no adverse effects in the mouse, although we're following the survival of the mouse during several months. If there is no adverse effects, uh, and the technique also works on patient cells in culture, and the cells are proliferating nicely, they're not dying because you have introduced a mutation. Well, I think if we meet these two conditions, then probably the regulatory agencies will permit to do tests in human. I just wanted to warn everyone that the meeting will end in the next minute. So I wanted to thank everyone again for participating, Dr. Chamblay and Dr. Marera for, for helping us understand a bit more about this technology. And I want to thank Carlo for, for helping us bring this to our community as well as everyone who participated and assisted this webinar. Thank you very much to everyone. Okay, I, I just want to emphasize and I'm always looking for good graduate students. <laughs> okay. thank, thank you, you everyone. Please have thank, a you, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Bye.